Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to uh, another uh, Zaytuna lecture. Uh, we often find that we start late and uh, people usually describe it as being uh, Islamic time and I'd like to make a correction. It's Muslim time versus Islamic time. Islamic time is precise and being always on time. Muslim time is like peoples of color time. So when you are invited at six, you know that's actually the invitation is for you to show up at nine, and inshallah you'll eat at 10. Right? So uh, this is just to get us on uh, the right footing. Uh, this is an exciting lecture that we have, uh, finding the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Bible, an inquiry into Surah 7, 157, 158 uh, verses. Uh, we're really uh, honored to have such a wide breadth of uh, specialties and expertise uh, among our Zaytuna faculty. Uh, Dr. At Ali Atai is definitely one of our beloved faculty in here. Uh, he's been involved in interfaith activities for over 20 years. Uh, he spent some time in Yemen studying Arabic and Islamic theology. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to alleviate the suffering and pain uh, on the people of Yemen, uh, considering how beautiful the country and the people are. And we also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to alleviate the suffering of people in Syria uh, as well. And we could go through other uh, countries as well. But uh, he's, been to see, he's been to Yemen and studying Arabic and Islamic theology. Uh, Dr. Atai holds a PhD in Islamic studies from the Graduate Theological Union and an MA degree in Biblical studies uh, from the Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley. Uh, just for point of reference, uh, Zaytuna College purchased this building uh, from the Pacific School of Religion, which is our uh, partner institution at GTU across the street. Uh, uh, Dr. Atai's degree in, uh, in Biblical Studies, uh, he was the first Muslim seminarian in the over 150 years of history of the school to earn this degree. Uh, so he definitely was uh, exploring areas that are not part of uh, the Muslim DNA field. So he's definitely outside of the Muslim DNA fields. Again, for those who don't know, Muslims usually study two, two majors. Uh, we have Muslim MDs and Muslim engineers. So definitely he went even beyond uh, intellectual genetic mutation to explore areas that are considerably outside the fields of Muslim majors. Uh, he is certified in Arabic, uh, Hebrew, uh, and Biblical Greek and is fluent in Farsi. Uh, here's an important description for uh, Ali Atai. He describes himself as an Iranian Sunni who reads Hebrew and loves chicken tikka masala. So without, all for, without further ado, Salam uh, Shatu Rasti, we welcome Dr. Ali Atai to the stage. Salam Alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. So I'm not Dr. Ali Atai, but um, I'll be doing the opening recitation, inshallah. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Al-lazina yattabi'oona rasoola nabiyya al-ummiyya al-lazhi yajidoonahu maktooban indahum Al-lazhi yajidoonahu maktooban indahum fi al-tawrat wal-injil Al-lazhi yajidoonahu maktooban indahum fi al-tawrat wal-injil yamuruhum bil-ma'ruf يأمرهم بالمعروف وينهاهم عن المنكر ويحل لهم الطيبات ويحرم عليهم الخبائث ويضع عنهم إصرهم والأغلال التي كانت عليهم 
فالذين آمنوا به وعزروه ونصروه واتبعوا النور الذي أنزل معه أولئك هم المفلحون قل يا أيها الناس إني رسول الله إليكم إني رسول الله إليكم جميعا الذي له ملك السماوات والأرض لا إله إلا هو يحيي ويميت فآمنوا بالله ورسوله النبي الأمي الذي يؤمن بالله وكلماته واتبعوه الذي يؤمن بالله وكلماته واتبعوه لعلكم تهتدون صدق الله العظيم And to those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet whom they find mentioned in their Torah and gospel, he enjoins them to do good and to forbid evil, and makes lawful to them the good things and unlawful the impure things. And he relieves them of their heavy burden and shackles that were upon them. Thus those who believe in him and who honor and support him and follow the light which has been sent down with him, those are the prosperous. Say, O people, I am Allah's messenger to you all, he to whom belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. There is no God but he. He gives life and causes to die. So believe in Allah and his messenger, the unlettered prophet who believes in Allah and his words, and follow him, that perchance you may be well guided. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. This is the first time I'm using technology. So if you know, my students know me. This is, uh, inshallah, I'll be okay. I'm kind of a techno uh, peasant. So we'll see how it goes, inshallah ta'ala. We are going to take a break, obviously, for Maghrib prayer at 8 o'clock. Um, now, before we look at actual verses from the biblical texts, we have to um, set the table, as it were, with respect to our methodology. And when we do look at actual biblical verses, we're going to focus almost exclusively on the Hebrew Bible and not on the New Testament, and that's just because we don't have enough time. Inshallah ta'ala, maybe next year or something, um, I'll do a lecture on something related to the New Testament, comparative Christology or crucifixion in the Quran or something like that, Muslim understanding or reading of the Gospel of John. So early Muslim exegetes prompted by this ayah, Ayatul, uh, um, Surah Al-A'raf, ayah number 157, um, quickly scanned the Bible, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, which is called the Old Testament by Christians, and the New Testament Gospels, the canonical Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they found nothing explicit, no explicit mention of the Prophet وسلم, anywhere. Therefore, according to Imam At-Tabari, for most exegetes, for most exegetes, the qualities, the qualities that identify and describe him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as a prophet, a true prophet, what Jewish theologians would call a nevi emet, these are mentioned in the Torah and in the Gospel, the general qualities of a true prophet, and he fits the description. Others concluded. No, there must have been specific references to the Prophet ﷺ. And Imam At-Tabari also mentions uh, that the position that the Ahlil Kitab, the people of the book, and here Kitab maybe means Bible, the word Bible means book, the people of the book, specifically the Jews, must have removed all references and descriptions of the Prophet ﷺ from their scriptures. And this is called Tahrif An-Nas. Let's see if I can do it. Ready? Bismillah. Subhanallah. 
textual alteration or corruption. And then a few Quranic ayat or passages were cited as evidence of such corruption or tahrif. For example, Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 46, min al hadu yuharrifun al-kalima amma wadi'i. Uh, according to one translation, from the Jews are those who displace words from their proper places. Or Al-Baqarah, verse 79, فَوَيْلُوا لِلَّذِينَ يَكْتَبُونَ الْكِتَابَ بِأَيْدِيهِمْ ثُمَّ يَقُولُوا هَذَا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ until the end of the ayah. Woe to those who write the book, Al-Kitab, the Bible, with their right hands or with their hands, and then they say, this is from God. Now, interestingly, there were early Christian scholars who made the same claim about the Jews. The early church father, an apologist, Justin Martyr, who died 165 of the Common Era, who's the father of Logos theology, he says in chapter 72 and 73 of his famous treatise, Dialogue with Trifo the Jew, he claims that Jewish leaders removed references to wood, W-O-O-D. They removed references to wood, in the, uh, from the books of Jeremiah and the Psalms in the Greek Septuagint, not the original Hebrew, but its Greek translation. Wood, for Justin Martyr, being a reference to the cross, a symbol of the crucifixion. So, according to some early Muslim exegetes, certain Jews corrupted the text. According to certain uh, early Christian exegetes, certain Jews corrupted the text, or at least it's very popular and semi-sacred Greek translation. Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi, a towering figure in Sunni Islam, finds the claim that the Jews were able to successfully remove all of the quote-unquote Mohammedan passages from the Tanakh simply untenable given the fact that at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu the Tanakh had basically reached a level of tawatur or multiple attestation. So how can they possibly pull this off, he wonders, all of the Jews on the entire planet. Now, one might point out that the Ben Asher Masoretic Hebrew text did become the standard uh, text of the Jews starting around the 12th century of the Common Era, and that probably has a lot to do with uh, none other than Maimonides endorsing that text. So Ben Asher did gain ascendancy over other Masoretic vocalizations or vocalizations that would eventually uh, be used by people like Ben Chayim in the early 16th century. But when you compare the two textual traditions, Ben Asher and Ben Chayim, there are some variations in wording, but the vast, vast majority of differences are differences in what are called niqut in Hebrew, or vowel notations, vowel pointings. So the bottom line is the Hebrew Bible that was um, existent in 7th century Arabia is basically the same as the Hebrew Bible used today. In the ayah in question, that the Prophet ﷺ is maktuban indahum fi Torati wal Injil, that the Prophet ﷺ is described in the Torah and the Gospel that is with them in the seventh century, and there have been no major evidences of some sort of major redaction that was done to the Tanakh after that point. The differences between the textual traditions of Ben Asher and Ben Chayim are very, very minor. Now, there are several Muslim scholars who did not confirm that the Bible had been, the text, of the, the text of the Bible had been altered at all, at least not in a significant way. Rather, the meanings of the text, right, had been altered or corrupted or concealed or ignored. This is called tahriful ma'ani, exegetical or interpretive alteration or corruption. This seems to be the position of Imam al-Razi himself and perhaps even the position of uh, Imam Ghazali. This, what I call textually affirming approach to the Bible, is no better exemplified by the great Damascene scholar, Imam Ibrahim ibn Umar al-Biqa'i, who died 1480, who used the Torah as a primary source of exegesis of the Quran, which is called an nazm al-Durar. And he even did a, uh, an Arabic diatessaron, as a harmony of the four canonical gospels of the New Testament. So Imam al-Biqa'i in his tafsir, Surah al-A'raf 157, will actually quote specific pesukhim or ayat of the Tanakh that he believes are references to the Prophet ﷺ. For example, and we'll talk about this one, Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, he quotes Deuteronomy 33.2, Psalm 118, 
It even goes into some New Testament passages, the paraclete passages of John 14 and 16. He believes to be references to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So for these ulama, for these ulama, the Quran does not argue that the text of the Bible was rewritten or replaced with false scripture, but rather that the text has been ignored or forgotten or concealed or misinterpreted. So, another translation, according to Gabriel Saeed Reynolds at Notre Dame, from the Jews are those who shifted the meanings of words from their proper contexts. In other words, they've misread the text, not altered the text. Now, the point of tonight's lecture is not to examine both Muslim approaches to the Bible, whether it's textual alteration or textual uh, affirmation and to make a case one way or another, that's a lecture for another time. The point I'm making now is that if we're going to find the Prophet ﷺ in the Bible, let us for now entertain Imam al-Biqa'i and assume that the text of the Bible is sound. With this said, a cursory skim of the Bible will not do. We need to look closer, we need to be more sophisticated. Now, according to the Quran, Jesus of Nazareth, peace be upon him, is the Messiah, he's Al-Masih, Ha-Mashiach, Ha-Christas, the Christ. And the Quran chastises the Jews for not accepting him as such. Now, the Quran's claim that the Jews, by and large, failed to read their scriptures properly with respect to the Prophet Wasallam echoes what New Testament authors said with respect to Jesus, peace be upon him. In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 14, Paul says about, quote, the children of Israel. He says, but their minds were closed even until today. The same veil remains over their reading, anagnosis, their reading of the Old Testament. He continues, it is not lifted, hati and Christu katargeitai, for only in Christ is it lifted. In other words, reading the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, with Christ in mind, this is a proper reading, an agnosis of the Old Testament. Christ is the key. Or as Augustine said, the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, while the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. So with respect to Isa alayhi salam, Jesus peace be upon him, both the Quran and the New Testament appeal to a proper reading of the Hebrew text. So give you an example. According to the New Testament Gospels, this is according to the Gospels, when Christ was crucified, his disciples were in total disarray, absolutely in shambles. Because if Jesus was the Messiah, how could he die? A dead Messiah for them was oxymoronic. It's like a four-sided triangle. This is how they understood their scriptures. By scriptures, I mean the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh. They were Jews. Now in Luke chapter 24, two of Jesus' disciples were walking to a town called Emmaus. And Jesus saw them and started to walk with them. And this is after the passion narrative and resurrection. Luke says that their eyes were restrained so that they did not recognize him. The Greek term here, epigynosko, means to know something very well, to understand something to know something at an intimate level, to have ma'rifa, or to recognize, recognition, to understand something you already knew, but at a deeper level. So Jesus says to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart uh, to believe in all that the Navim, the prophets, have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And they're probably thinking, suffered? The Messiah will suffer? And then Luke says, and beginning at Moses and all of the prophets, beginning at Moses, Deuteronomy, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, then all the prophets, Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah, Micah, Ezekiel, so on and so forth, he expounded to them the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And the Greek term here for expounded is diermeneuo, uh, which is a combination of dia, a preposition, which means uh, through or by means of, and hermeneuo, which is where you get the word hermeneutic from. So Jesus interpreted to them, through an interpretation, he interpreted the scriptures, uh, ta peri iautu, the things concerning himself. 
Then Luke concludes and says, Then their eyes were open, kai epe gnosan autan, and they knew him, they understood him, they recognized him. Ah, it is Jesus. So what did Jesus actually say to the disciples? Luke doesn't tell us, but early Christian exegetes imagine the conversation to have gone something like this. Do you remember the Passover lamb of Exodus 12 and Leviticus 16? Do you remember Psalm 22? Elahi, Elahi, lama sabachthani, this cry of dereliction. Do you remember the suffering servant of Isaiah 50 and 52 and 53? He was smitten and afflicted, a man of sorrows. They were all pointing to me. Oh, now we recognize you. So, according to Paul, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Jesus himself, a proper reading of Scripture entails accepting that Scripture is polyvalent. It has multiple levels of meaning. Scripture for them, and early Christian exegetes and church fathers, was oracular, Sibylline, prognostic, predictive. In other words, it pointed to the future. Matthew alludes to the Hebrew Bible some 80 times in his gospel. Oftentimes he prefaces by saying, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, whoever that prophet might have been. So for early Christian exegetes, scripture, that is to say the Hebrew Bible, was predictive in three ways. A straightforward prophecy, a typology or typological exegesis. Uh, so a straightforward prophecy, obviously explicitly future. A typology can be implicit, is implicitly future. And an allegory, which can be implicitly future. And we'll come back to these terms, inshallah. Now, if you study the history of Sunni exegesis or tafsir, you will notice that Sunni exegetical methods were inclusive, they were integrative, they were interdiscipl interdisciplinary. Initially, the Sunnis, or proto-Sunnis, they used the Hadith corpus, but then they incorporated things like philology, which is the primary method used by the Mu'tazila, Imam al-Zamakhshari. And then they incorporated things like mystical exegesis or ta'wil, a Sufi method, this idea that, there, that uh, the Qur'an has a dhahiri or exoteric aspect as well as a botany, a, an esoteric aspect. Why were the Sunnis like this? Because the goal was to have fahm of this ocean, as Imam al-Ghazali refers to the Qur'an. And if utilizing different methods uh, facilitated this deep understanding or penetrating insight to Dabbur into the Quran, then they would use that method, of course, within the framework of Sunni theological um, orthodoxy. No less than Imam al Ghazali says in the Mishkat al Anwar, Walil Qurani Dahirun Mabatan, the Quran has an exoteric and esoteric dimension. And for Ghazali, it is imperative that both be acknowledged. So in the Mishkat, he quotes a hadith, لا تدخل الملائكة بيتا فيه كلب. The angels don't enter a house that has a dog. And he would argue that if the esoteric aspect is denied, for example, you simply say that simply means a dog, period. And that's all it means. He said this leads to literalism. And then he says if the exoteric aspect is denied, Right? If you say, no, it doesn't mean a dog at all. It means something like dog-like qualities. This is also wrong according to him. So the exoteric aspect is denied, then you fall into the dangerous waters of eisegesis. So exegesis means to pull out from the text. Eisegesis means to read into the text something that isn't there. Uh, some scholars refer to this as hermeneutical waterboarding, that you torture a text long enough and it will say whatever you want. Some refer to this as chasing leprechauns. With respect to tafsir, the apparent, sorry, with respect to the dhahir, the uh, apparent aspect of the Qur'an, there is a rule of tafsir. When defining a word in the Qur'an, the meaning of that word must fall within normative semantic parameters, and this is called a had, according to the hadith, an acceptable semantic range insofar as that, uh, as that definition doesn't conflict with the plain meaning of the text, and it is understood by its initial audience, in this case, Qurayshi Arabs living in the Hijaz in the seventh century. Imam Zarkashi said, the exegete must choose the most prevalent meanings of words, primary definitions, and not utilize vague or obscure definitions as used by poets. 
not to use definitions hidden in the deep, dark recesses of the Arabic lexicon. I'll give you just an example. Uh, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa alayhi salam, idrib bi asaq al-bahra, strike with your staff the ocean. And that's how the Arabs understood it. It makes sense. Immediately they would have understood it like that. It makes sense according to the context. If somebody comes along and says, no, you know, al-bahra doesn't mean ocean. It means the nobleman. So God is telling Moses, take your staff and strike a nobleman of Bani Israel. Then this would b break the rule of tafsir or breach its had, its prevalent semantic range. So it's not about possible meanings. It's about prevalent meanings when dealing with the Qur'an's zahir or apparent aspect. Now according to the hadith uh, that is quoted by Imam Suyuti and Tabari, every verse of the Qur'an also has a matla or a point of ascent. And this is taken by scholars to mean a deeper or higher meaning. So there's a horizontal aspect to the Qur'an, horizontal aspect uh, corresponding to the, the prevalent meanings of Arabic words at that time. And then there's a vertical aspect, right? Higher meanings. Now, these meanings may not readily be known, but their existence should be acknowledged. The polyvalence of the Quran should be acknowledged. Another example, uh, Imam Ghazali says, again, uh, again, uh, God and Moses, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Musa alayhi salam, ikhla'na alayk, take off your sandals. Imam Ghazali says, well, what do you think that means? Exactly what it sounds like, take off your sandals. And then he says something interesting. He says, yeah, but there's something deeper here. He says the left sandal represents the dunya, the right sandal represents al-akhirah. Strip yourself of the two worlds and focus exclusively on me, on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not that the word na'al means world, but it represents the world. So some might call this a tafsir bil-ishara, and this is in Sunni tradition. So these are insights given by God himself to an exegete, or a reader as divine gifts. However, the exeget must not uh, insist on the absolute correctness uh, or authority of these subtle insights, must not be dogmatic. Rulings or creedal articulations are not derived from these. These are things just to think about. Okay. Getting close. So let us entertain the Ghazalian paradigm that there are exoteric and esoteric dimensions to the Qur'an, a zahir and a batin. This is how early Christians viewed the Hebrew Bible and were thus able to find Jesus in the Hebrew scriptures. Perhaps we can find the Prophet Wasallam in the same way. As stated earlier, for early Christian exegetes, scripture was oracular, it was predictive. Identifying Christic typologies in the Old Testament was of paramount importance. Typology, or typological exegesis, examines Old Testament figures and events as prefiguring or foreshadowing figures and events in the New Testament. For example, Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 14, he's doing a comparison between Adam and Jesus, peace be upon them, and this is what he says about Adam. He says, he says has estin tupas, tu melantas, Adam who is the type of the one to come. Adam is the type, the foreshadowing of Jesus who is the anti-type. One of the most popular Christic typologies in the Old Testament is in Genesis 22. This is called the Aqidah passage, the binding of Isaac, which is related to the word Aqidah, beliefs that bind us. So here, uh, Clement of Alexandria, Origen of Alexandria, Augustine of Hippo, they say very interesting things. They say here, Abraham, whose name means father of many nations, the father, he takes wood and he puts it on the back of Isaac, his son, his beloved son, his only beloved son, according to Genesis 22, and he has him march up a hill and he's going to sacrifice him. So these Christian exegetes, they say, this is exactly what God would do to his son, in quotes. A sort of dress rehearsal of the crucifixion So with typological exegesis, the zahir is the actual concrete historical event, which is the binding of Isaac. Whereas the batin, let me just check the time here. Ah, we got one minute. Whereas the batin is a foreshadowing of a future person or event, something pointing to the future. 
Augustine referred to these two aspects as history and symbol. Mm -hmm. Or we can say uh, type and anti-type. Another very famous example of typological exegesis amongst early Christians. We'll end with this and then we'll take a break. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 where it says where Isaiah is speaking to a king named Ahaz and he says to the king that the Lord himself will give you an ot which means sign. It's the same as the word ayah. He says, Hine ha'alma hara. Behold, the young woman will conceive. Vayoledeth bain vekarat shmo immanuel. A young woman will give, uh, will conceive and give birth to a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, Justin Martyr actually mentions this in chapter 84 of his dialogue with Trifo the Jew. His Jewish interlocutor, Trifo, no doubt responds that Emmanuel is actually born in the very next chapter, Isaiah chapter 8. He is the son of King Ahaz. Justin responds, paraphrastically, yes, Emmanuel ben Ahaz is also a tupas, a symbol of Christ. Ben Ahaz is the concrete meaning. The hidden meaning points to Christ in the future, the virgin birth. Of course, Jesus himself saw what had happened to Jonah as prefiguring himself. Matthew and Luke record that Jesus said, peace be upon him, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man, referring to himself, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus himself, according to the New Testament, engages in typological exegesis. He identifies himself as a Noahidic antitype. Okay, it's a good time for a break. I know this is a bit long-winded, but I have to set the table. When I come back, inshallah ta'ala, we'll talk about typology in, amongst Muslim exegetes, and then we'll get into some uh, verses, actual verses of the Hebrew Bible. So let's break for prayer. Assalamu alaikum. So I was talking about type and anti-type, or typological exegesis. Muslim exegetes have been known to dabble in typology. Some mentioned that, for example, the pharaoh is a tupas or a type or an illustration of the Antichrist, a powerful world leader who will oppress the people of God, claim divinity, be opposed by a prophetic hero, and then eventually dies epically. They also mention that Joseph, Yusuf alayhi salam, is a Muhammadan tupas or type opposed by his brethren, in this case the Quraysh, forced to leave his city of Mecca, given political power in Medina, eventually given power over his brethren, and then he forgives them. In fact, the Prophet Sallallahu he seems to have seen himself as a Josephine anti-type of sorts. He said at the conquest of Mecca, La tathriba alaykum al This is quoting Surat Yusuf alayhi salam. So somebody might say, well, what's your delil? What's your proof that we can engage in this type of typological exegesis? Well, it seems that the Prophet Sallallahu himself seems to have thought in terms of typology. Now, typology, while being a popular method of interpretation among early Christians, is not popular among Jewish exegetes. Similarly, typology is much more prevalent among Shia exegetes than Sunni exegetes, although the latter do not reject this method completely. One of the reasons could be that both groups were trying to prove their theological positions in the face of an overwhelming majority that did not accept their positions. In the case of the former, the messiahship or Christhood of Jesus, peace be upon him, and in the latter, the imamate. In other words, appealing to the acknowledged polyvalence of revealed scripture provided these minority groups with a strong argument for their positions, none other than the eponym of the Ja'fari school of thought, uh, Ja'far al-Sadiq, radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa ardah, is reported to have said, that scripture has four levels of meaning. There is the expression, the lafz, which is gathered by the awam, the laity. Then there are illusions, isharat, that are known by the ulama, mufassirin. There are subtleties, lata'if, that are known by al-anbiya and awliya. And then haqa'iq, realities, that are known uh, only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I just want to look at a few brief examples. Oh. Yes. Okay, good. Um, of typology 
amongst uh, the Shia. And the first one I didn't put on here, it's Hadith of Safina. This is a Hadith that's also in Sunni books. Uh, where the Prophet Sallallahu is reported to have said, مَثَلُ أَهْلِ بَيْتِكَ مَثَلِ سَفِينَةِ نُوحِ مَنْ رَكِبَهَا فَقَدْ نَجَعْ وَمَنْ دَخَلَّفَ عَنْهَا فَقَدْ حَلَكْ That the similitude of my family, the prophetic house, is like the Ark of Noah. Whoever embarks upon it is saved, and whoever rejects it is doomed. So the Ark of Noah, which is historical according to uh, uh, Islam or Muslims, is a symbol of the prophetic house. In other words, the prophetic house is a Noahidic anti-type. But the flood at the end of time will not be of water, although there will be floods, but rather a deluge of sin and immorality, at least according to the Shia exegetes. Another example, Surah Al-Anbiya, ayah number 73, which is about the family of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Shia exegetes who engage in typological exegesis, they see in this ayah a prefiguring or foreshadowing of the ithna ashara imaman, the 12 imams. And we made them imams. That they are given iha, which is a type of non prophetic revelation. They also point out things like the word imam is mentioned exactly 12 times in the Quran, right? The last example, very, very interesting example I wanted to give you, Imam Taba Taba'i Al-Mizan. So this is from what's known as the Quranic Aqidah passage. So remember that we said uh, Clement and Origen and Augustine, they all see in Genesis 22, the biblical Aqidah passage, the binding of Isaac, a typology of Jesus Christ. The Shia see in Surah 37, a typology of Imam al Hussein. So verse 106, they point out, إِنَّ هَذَا لَهُوَ الْبَلَاءُ الْمُبِينَ Right, God uh, stops Abraham from sacrificing his son. Indeed, this was an obvious test, بَلَاء. وَفَدَيْنَاهُ بِذِبْحٍ عَظِيمٍ And then we ransomed him with a, with a great sacrifice. And Imam Taba Taba'i, he quotes here, Imam al-Suyuti, why is this sacrifice so azim? It's because the ram is paradisial. Gabriel brought a ram from paradise. He said, that's true, that's on the dhahir. But the batini meaning is a foreshadowing or typology of the martyrdom of Imam al Hussein. And then verse 115, al karbil azim. right, that uh, we saved them both. And here the context is Moses and Aaron, which according to the Shia exegetes here are Muhammadan and Alawi types, right? Hadith of the Prophet وسلم, mentioned in Sunni and Shia books that the Prophet وسلم, said, to, said to Sayyidina Ali, Karamallahu Wajha, are you not pleased that you are to me as Aaron is to Moses, except there is no prophet after me. So he points out here, you have Bala, right? In verse 106, there's something interesting. Ten verses later, you have the word Karb, Karbala, right? On the 10th of Muharram, and then you have Dhib Azim, the great sacrifice in the middle of that. The last example I give you, this is um, an example of allegorical exegesis. So there's a difference between typological exegesis and allegorical exegesis. Allegorical exe exegesis has an abstract concept attached to a concrete image, and the hidden meaning or the abstract meaning is privileged over its literal sense, whereas in typological exegesis, both the concrete and hidden meanings are equally important. So in allegory, the hidden meaning is more important. C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. That's not a true story. I hate to burst your bubbles. It is a religious allegory. Aslan is Christ, right? Superman doesn't exist. Or does he? No, it doesn't exist. It's an allegory. It's a, it's a Christic allegory. Believe it or not, and the founders, the, the inventors of Superman were two Jewish men. Go figure. Oy vey. The Wizard of Oz. The scarecrow represents the agrarian past the Tin Man, the technological future, we need to forge ahead with the courage of a lion. So it's interesting here, Muhammad Baqar al-Majlisi, a Shi'i uh, exeget, he looks at this, the first four verses of Surah al-Shams. وَالشَّمْسِ وَالْدُحَاهَا وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّاهَا وَالْلَيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَاهَا 
by the sun and its light, by the moon when it follows it, by the day when it manifests it, and the night when it envelops it. That's what it literally says. But the hidden meaning takes precedence over this according to Al-Majlisi. The shams is the Prophet wasallam. The light is his pure, unadulterated teaching, the pure sunnah, the true sunnah. The moon that follows him is Ali. The nahar are the a'imma the uh, imams that manifest the true sunnah in the layl Bani Umayyah, who envelops or persecutes the true sunnah of the Prophet Okay, all of that was intro. Had to be said. So far so good with the technology. I'm going to reach for my Hebrew Bible. So at this point, I'm gonna do my best imitatio Christi, my best imitation of Christ. And instead of going to Emmaus, let's take a trip to Medina. I was working all night on that. On that one. <laughs> so beginning with Moses and all the prophets, I will attempt to expound the Tanakh, the things concerning the Prophet ﷺ. Do I know for sure that these are describing the Prophet ﷺ? No, I don't know. Allahu alam, right? Uh, but something interesting to, again, just think about. So the first one here. This one, I would consider to be a straightforward prophecy, explicitly future. So the context is that Jacob is on his deathbed, and he gathers his 12 sons around him, and he says to them, he says to them, uh, gather yourselves together so that I might tell you what will befall you in the latter days. The Hebrew is be'acharit hayyamim, literally fi'achril ayam, in the latter days, right? As the Mormons would say, the latter days. And the Prophet وسلم, he said, right? He said, the, uh, the, the hour, the eschaton and I are like this, meaning that he is the first major sign of the sa'a or the eschaton. So Jacob, he begins to prophesy about his son, so about Reuben, about Simeon and Levi, and then he gets to Judah, and Judah um, in the latter days uh, is the eponym of the entire group of Bani Israel, the Jew, the Bani Israel collectively are known as Yehudim, the Jews. So this is what he said, what's going to happen to the Jews in the latter days? The Hebrew says, Lo yasur shevet mihuda. He says, the shevet, which is the king's staff or scepter, will not pass or depart from Judah, meaning the Jews. Umechokek midbein ragalev, nor uh, the legislator or sacred law from between his feet, literally, meaning from his seed or progeny, adiki yavu shilo, until the coming of someone called the shilo, velo yikahath amim, and to him shall be the gathering of all nations. Right, so this is interesting. It seems to say that Prophecy. So what, is, what does the king's staff represent, the scepter? According to the New Testament, it seems to indicate prophecy. So Matthew 21, 43 and 44, Jesus is reported to have said to the Pharisees, have you ever read in the scriptures? And then he paraphrases the Psalms, Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected, the same has become the Rosh Pina, the main cornerstone this is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful in your eyes. Therefore, I say unto you that the Malkutha de Allah, Syriac for kingdom of God, prophecy, shall be taken away from you and given to a nation that bears the proper fruits. Who is this rejected stone, if not Ismail, as Dr. Winter says, the outcast, the ethnically impure son, the rejected son is finally chosen. There's a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. It's in the Shema'il of Imam al-Tirmidhi. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is reported to have said, I am the gatherer upon whose feet all of humanity will be gathered. So it seems like this, um, this prophecy of Jacob is referring to the vocation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the Shafi'ah as the one, who's into, the one who intercedes on the Yom Al-Qiyamah and whose intercession uh, is accepted. And then, velo yikahath amim, and unto him shall be the gathering of everybody, all peoples, this idea that this 
Shiloh, and this is a hapax legomenon. This is the only time this word appears in the entire Hebrew Bible. It's very, very mysterious. What, is, what does Shiloh mean? Jesenius says that the root is shalah, which means something like peace or tranquility. Uh, and he will actually translate this as the peacemaker. And then he also, Jesenius, Hebrew Chaldee lexicon to the New Testament, to the Old Testament. He also says that this could be a reference to someone in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 5, that we'll talk about as well. But this person is universal. Alamiya, right? Okay. And obviously, many Christian exegetes believe that this uh, is a reference to Isa, a.s. and we can certainly talk about that. The next one I want to look at is probably the most famous one. This is in Deuteronomy, or Devarim, and this is the fifth book of the Torah, or the Chumash, Pentateuch, what have you. And this begins, this is very interesting, the beginning of this uh, has very unconventional syntax. The first word, a prophet. Why is that interesting? Is because biblical Hebrew is not inflected. Some philologists believe that archaic Hebrew was inflected. There was inflection, i'rab, like sometimes, you know, we say um, muslimun, musliman, muslimin, depending on its case ending in a sentence, right? If it's nominative or accusative or genitive. So Hebrew is not, biblical Hebrew is not like that. So word order is very, very important in Hebrew. You have to follow fi'il, fa'il, maf'ul. And if there's a break in, this in, in the syntax and it's unconventional like it is here, then there's very strong emphasis being made. So a prophet, what a prophet. Navi akim lahem mikarev achayhem. A prophet, God is speaking to Moses. A prophet I will raise up from their brethren. Right? And who are the brethren of the Israelites? Well, other Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 17, God commands the Israelites to pick a king from their brethren, and they pick King Saul, who was a Benjaminite. It also says in Deuteronomy that the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, the brother of Jacob, and the Jacobites and Edomites don't like each other, but that's not the point, is that the Edomites are Arabs, and in Deuteronomy chapter 2, it's, God says to the Israelites, you're going to pass through Edom the land of your brethren. So, Achehem could refer either to fellow Israelites or to Arabs. But we have to keep reading. Here. Kamoka. Kamoka. Kamaka. Kama. Who is going to be like you? So, here we have the typological uh, aspect of this verse. Right? That this prophet to come is going to be like Moses. Moses is the type, and this prophet is a mosaic anti-type. Now, what's very interesting is when the Prophet ﷺ received the initial revelation on Jabal al-Nur, he went to Waraqa bin Nawfal, uh, who is a Christian scribe. There's a hadith in Bukhari that says that Waraqa kana yaktubu al-Injil bil Arabiya wal Ibraniya, that Waraqa used to write the gospel in Arabic and in Syriac or Hebrew. And so he explained to Waraka bin Nofal what had happened to him. And Waraka said something interesting. He said, akbar, The great nomos, right? The great law or sharia of God has come unto you. Kama ja'a ila Musa. Just as kama is the same particle used in 1818 Deuteronomy, it's possible that Waraka had this verse in mind when he was giving this advice to the Prophet Wasallam. Allahu alam, just as it came to Moses, you are going to receive the great law. What's also interesting is in the Quran, you find a common juxtaposition between Musa alayhi salam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi This technical term in Semitic rhetoric is called parataxis, according to Michelle Kuypers. I promised I'd give him a shout out. There you go. Abdullah, where are you? For example, Surah Al-Muzammil, Inna arsalna ilaykum rasulan shahidan alaykum kama arsalna kama arsalna ila fir'awna rasula. That we have sent unto you an apostle to be a witness against you just as we sent uh, to Pharaoh an apostle. So we have this juxtaposition between Musa alayhi salam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. But I think the greatest similarity between the two prophets that cannot be denied is that both prophets received a comprehensive law code. 
Musa alayhi salam received the, according to the Orthodox, a written and oral Torah from which halaqa, which is Jewish law, is derived. Whereas the Prophet وسلم, received the Quran and of course his normative ethos or sunnah, which is the source of Islamic sharia. No other two prophets, at least in the Abrahamic tradition, come close to this similarity. Now, we keep reading. So this prophet will be like Moses. And, it's, and then it says, And I shall put my words into his mouth, and he shall speak everything that I command him. Or another way of translating that is that whatever he speaks is only by command. Right? And of course we have the ayat in the Quran, najmi إِذَا hawa مَا ضَلَّ صَحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى وَمَا يَنْتِكُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُ يُوحَى that the Prophet ma yantiku. Yantiku is a fi'l mudari. It's an imperfect tense verb. Usually it's negated with la, but here it's ma, which means never, that the Prophet ﷺ never speaks from his desire or caprice. Everything he says is wahi, is revelation. Okay, now what's interesting also is this, uh, this prophecy is carried into the New Testament period in John chapter 1. In the New Testament, we are told that uh, Levites sent messengers to Yahya alayhi salam, John the Baptist, who was baptizing people in the Jordan River. They want to know, who do you think you are? So they say to him, Su tis a, who are you? To John the Baptist. And then John says, the author of the Gospel of John, the, 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 uh, the evangelist, he says that John the Baptist did not deny, and he confessed, and he said, Uk eimi ego ha Christas, I am not the Christ. So then the messengers ask him, who are you then? Are you Elijah? According to Jewish theology, the prophet Elijah or Eliyahu was carried up into heaven on a chariot of fire, according to the book of 2 Kings, and that he will come again just before the Messiah. He will be sort of the herald of the Messiah. So then the messengers from the Levites ask John the Baptist, are you Elijah? And he says, uh, Amy, I am not. So then they ask him a third question. So the Jews, the New Testament period, were waiting for three great luminaries. This is how they understood this verse. They ask him a third question, and that question is, Ha prophetes esu, are you the prophet? Right? So the question is not, are you a prophet? The question is, are you the prophet? And the prophet, if you have a cross-reference in your Bible, it is a reference to Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, the Mosaic antitype, right? So there's three distinct lines of prophecy, the coming of Elijah, or I should say the second coming of Elijah, the coming of the Christ, and the coming of the prophet. So I would say that really only in Islam do the scriptures find fulfillment, right? Uh, in Luke, Jesus actually says John the Baptist is Elijah. John the Baptist didn't know at that time, but he comes in the spirit and power of Elijah, not a literal reincarnation. Obviously, Jesus is the Christ, so who is the prophet? I'm aware that in the book of Acts, Jesus is identified as being the Mosaic prophet of 1818 Deuteronomy, but there seems to be some um, incongruency here because in the Gospel of John, clearly these are three distinct lines of prophecy. All right. Next one. There's only six of these. I hope I'm not bo boring you stiff. As long as I'm entertained, it's really all that matters. So this one is from Isaiah. It's a very interesting book, by the way. Isaiah is prophesizing. And this one, again, is taken by Christians to be a reference or a, a prophecy and a typology of Jesus. So a typology because perhaps the immediate reference is to King Hezekiah. Right? It's probably describing King Hezekiah, but there's something under the surface foreshadowing someone else to come, possibly. So this is what it says. It says, it says Ki yeled yulad lanu in the Hebrew. It says, uh, for, uh, for a child will be born to us. And this verb, yulad, is actually a pu'al, uh, perfect. It's fi'l madi. It's in the past tense. But it's translated as future because according to Williams in his Hebrew uh, grammar, Oftentimes, he says, oftentimes in the Old Testament, uh, God will use a past tense verb 
um, to emphasize something to come in the future. This is called the prophetic past. For example, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ We find this in the Quran. إِنَّ أَعْطَيْنَكَ الْكَوْثَرُ أَعْطَيْنَا Past tense. We will give you kawthar. Or we have already given you kawthar. So it says, a child will be born. And then it says, بَيْنْ نِتَانْ lanu. A son will be given. فَتْحِيْهَ misra al الْشِخْمُ and there will be some sort of symbol of authority upon his shechem, upon his shoulder. Now at this point, Christians have an interesting translation for the rest of this pesuch, or this verse, this ayah, if you will. They take this next verb, vayikra, which means to call, as passive. So their translations are invariably, and his name shall be called. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Eternal Father, the Prince of Peace. That's how they translate it. But if you look at the actual vowel pointings here, vayikra, it is clearly in the active voice. And clearly there's a subject doer and a direct object here. At least this is my contention. So why do Christians tend to translate that way? It's because it says Mighty God. Right? And Christians, at least Trinitarians, believe that Jesus is essentially God. But there's a problem here. It also calls him eternal Father, and the Father and the Son are separate and distinct hypostatic entities. So even a Christian reading of the text has some, in my opinion, theological problems from a, Christ, from a Christian standpoint. But a better translation in my mind is that taking the verb as active and the wonderful counselor, meaning God, the mighty God, the eternal father, which means the Rabb, Ab means Rabb, shall call his name Prince of Peace, Amirus Salam. Of course, the business of the birthmark or symbol of authority on the prophet's Shechem or Ketif, right? This is mentioned in, in multiple sources. Bahira the monk, according to Sirah, knew about this this khatam between his shoulder blades, Salman al-Farisi, uh, apparently knew about it. There's actually an entire chapter in the Shama'il of Imam al-Tirmidhi, Babu ma ja'a fi khatam in dabuwa bayna ketifay, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A whole chapter on this birthmark on his shoulder blade, which is an indication of his authority as a prophet. What's also interesting is that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered into Medina, Abdullah ibn Salam, who was a rabbi at the time, uh, he said that the first thing that the Prophet said, first of all, he said, Araftu anna wajhahu laysa bi wajhi kadab. I recognize, Araftu, recognize, I recognize his face was not the face of a liar. And then he said that the Prophet said, Ya ayyuhan nas, afshu salama wa at'imu ta'ama wa silu al-arham wa sallu bil-layl wa nasu niyam tadkhul jannata bi salam. O oh, people, spread peace, share your food, maintain ties of kinship, pray in the night when others are asleep, and you shall enter paradise in peace. So it begins with peace, he ends with peace. That's the, what, what rhetoricians will call the inclusio theme of that entire statement. It's about peace, almost as if he's identifying himself as the prophet of peace, or the Sar Shalom, Amirus Salam, the Prince of Peace. Okay. That one usually ruffles a lot of Christian feathers. It's okay. We can have a nice discussion. Many of my teachers are Christian. I love them. Okay. Here's another one. This is uh, also in Isaiah. This one doesn't need a lot of commentary. Um, I would consider this also a straightforward prophecy as well as a typology. I think the immediate reference is to people at that time. I think the lesson is something like whether one is learned or unlearned in order to be guided by God, one must approach God's word with sort of his openness and a teachable spirit, right? But there's interesting verse 12 here. So this says, the nitan, and this is perfect with vav consecutive, so this is explicitly future. The nitan ha al asher lo yada sefer, and the book, the book, the revelation, scripture, sefer, al-kitab. The book will be given to one who does not know letters. And it shall be said to him, which is here. It is the exact cognate of iqra. 
and he shall answer, Lo yada'ati sefer, I don't know a book, I am unlettered. Ma'ana biqari. Moving on, almost done. Aha, Isaiah 42. This is very interesting. Again, I would consider it a straightforward prophecy and possibly a typology. Maybe the immediate reference is to Israel that is personified as a servant of God. So this is a long chapter. I'll just give you some highlights. It says, Hen abdi ethmachbo bichri ratsa nafshi. Behold my abd, whom I uphold. Right? And this is the primary title of the Prophet وسلم, in the Quran. Subhana ladhi asra bi abdihi. فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي نَزَّلَ الْفُرْقَانَ عَلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ And when the Prophet ﷺ would hear these ayat, he would begin to weep that Allah is calling him Abd. So here, behold my Abd, the same word in Hebrew, whom I uphold, my chosen one, and whom my soul delights. And of course, the Prophet ﷺ is Al-Mujtaba. He is Al-Mustafa, Al-Mukhtar. It continues, uh, Nafati ruhi alive, I shall put my ruh upon him, a spirit of revelation. Mishpat le goyim yotzi, he shall bring law and order to the goyim. The goyim are Gentiles. The word in Arabic for Gentile is ummi, right? So, Nabi al ummi, al ladin yattabi'un al rasul, al Nabi al ummi, those who follow the apostle, the unlettered prophet, the Gentile prophet, these are possible. The motherly prophet, all of these meanings are possible. All these meanings are prevalent. Um, and then it continues. Walo yashmi kolo. Very interesting. He will not raise his voice in the marketplace. There is a hadith in the Shema'il, our mother Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says about the Prophet, وسلم, because again, nobody knows the husband like the wife. She says, Wala uh, sakhaban fil aswaq that he didn't even raise his voice in the marketplace. It continues, now we have iltifat in the Hebrew text, we have sudden change of person. Now God is speaking directly to this abd, to this, this servant of God, and he says, am. I will give you as a covenant of humanity. So this prophet is, again, this abd is alamiyya, he's universal. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنِّي رُسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا Surah Al-A'raf 158, the ayah that we heard, one of the ayahs that we heard at the beginning of the event. لَأُورْ goyim it says, as a light of the Gentiles, نُورُ ummiyin, a light of the Gentiles. This is a construct phrase, mudaf mudaf ilayhi, construct noun, absolute noun. Just skipping around. Shirula Adunai Shir Khadash. Sing unto the Lord a new song, a sacred song, in a new scripture, a new language, possibly. Continuing. Ah, who will sing this new song according to the text? It says the islanders, the Gentiles, right? The Goyim, the Iyim, the islanders, the Goyim, the Gentiles. And then it says, Khatsarim Teshev Qaidar, and the villages that Kedar inhabits. Kedar. Who is Kedar? Kedar is the second son of Ismail, alayhi salam, according to Genesis. His name is mentioned eight times in the Hebrew Bible. Jesenia says, the rabbis call all of the Arabians universally by this name. And Leishan Qaidar, Lisanu Qaidar, is called, is used of the Arabic language. So the Jews refer to Arabic as Leishan Qaidar, the tongue of Kedar. So this Evid, he will be uh, accepted. They will sing his new song. Who will? The islanders, the Gentiles, and the Arabs. Another proof text of this, Ezekiel 27, 21. It says, Arav the kol nasi e Qaidar. Arabia and all the princes of Kedar. And then it continues here, Isaiah 42. Let the inhabitants of the rock sing. What is the rock? Of course, Alcatraz. Just check. I'm just checking to see if you're still awake. 
Good. You're paying attention. No, not maybe. I mean, we are, we are entertaining typological exegesis. Anyway, um, maybe I'll go to Alcatraz and sing and fulfill the prophecy. No, this, cela, this is very enigmatic. Nobody really knows what this means. Some believe it's, you know, cela is just sort of what the Bible calls a generic sort of house of God, a fortress, a tabernacle of God of some sort. Some say it means Petra in Jordan. There is a mountain in Medina called Salah, by the way. There's a mountain in Medina. It's mentioned in the Hadith. Wallahu alam. Continuing with this Isaiah chapter 42. They will be greatly ashamed. Those who trust in carved images. Those who say to molten images, Atem Eloheinu, you are our gods. So this servant, this evid of God, stands as a bulwark against idolatry. And then it continues to call him Avdi, my servant, Malaki, my messenger. It calls him Meshullam, Meshullam, like the perfect or sound one. Evid Adonai, Abdullah. So that's 42. Last one. This is in the Song of Songs. There's many more we can look at, but again, no time. This is the last one I'll talk about. And again, this is just, uh, just some, some of it. The Song of Songs is called the Canticum Canticorum in Latin. It's called the Song of Solomon as well. In Hebrew, it's called Shir Hashirim, Shir Hashirim, which is a way of forming a superlative in Hebrew, meaning sort of the best song, right, or the best uh, eulogy, something like that. This is uh, probably an allegory, I would say. Um, so what we have here is really a dialogue between a lover and his beloved. It looks like a man and his wife. You know, one of my teachers said marriage is a living parable for mystical union with God. At least it's supposed to be. Um, inshallah, it is. Uh, allegory, um, possibly, for the relationship between God and Israel, according to Talmudic rabbis, or God and humanity, according to Maimonides. Christians believe this is an allegory uh, of the love between Christ and his church, right? There's a book by Roger Aylesworth, who is the president of the Illinois Baptist Association. It's called, He is Altogether Lovely Finding Christ in the Song of Songs. But anyway, Chapter 5, verses 10 through 16, we have a physical description of the beloved. A physical description. So this is what it says. Dodit sachva adom. My beloved is literally white and red. White and red. In the Shema'il, the Prophet wasallam is described, Sayyidina Ali says, Abyad mushrab, which is something like a white mixed with redness. The Hebrew continues, Degul Mervava, chosen amongst 10,000, which is something like saying he's very, very special. Rosho Ketem Paz, his head is like gold, meaning his intellect is fantastic. Gfutsotav Tal Talim, Shachorot Ka Orev, his locks are wavy and black uh, as a raven. In his hadith, in the Shema'il, the Prophet ﷺ's hair was neither straight nor curly, but wavy. And what's interesting here, this word is Orev, Ayin Reish Beit, Arab. This is the same word for Arab. And it's translated as raven here. Now, this word appears in the plural in the book of 1 Kings. And it says that when Elijah was in the wilderness, the translation, almost all translations except for one, say that the ravens came and gave him food and drink. There's one lone translation I found, Farrar Fenton, died 1920, the Holy Bible in modern English, who translates it there as Arabs, that the Arabs came and brought food and drink to Elijah. And many rabbis accept this translation and say that this is an indication that towards the end of time, uh, Arabs and Jews will come together under the banner of the Messiah. 
But here, so you could translate here, quite naturally, his locks are wavy and black as an Arab. Almost done. Then it continues to describe his eyes, his cheeks, his hands, his um, countenance. Verse 16, it says, His mouth is sweet. He is altogether desirable. This is my beloved and this is my friend. O oh, daughters of Jerusalem. So we have this word here. is Mahamadim. So this is poetry, right? It's elliptical. It's indirect. That's the nature of poetry. So we have something like an echo of the name of the Prophet This might relate to its esoteric aspect. So poetry is not going to give you the answer. For example, we have a sort of clue as to the name of the Messiah in Psalm 20. Verse 6, David writes, David writes, I know that God saves his Messiah. He shall hear him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. The name of the Messiah is Yeshua, the one saved by God. Right? That's how poetry works. All right. I am done. It's almost nine. I took so much time. Sorry about that. But we'll try to take a few, maybe one or two. People aren't tired. You can get out and leave if you want. No, I'm just joking. Don't throw fruit at me. Um, any questions or comments? If anyone has a question, they can just go forward now to the Q&A mic, which is at the oh, yeah. front left. Okay, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for this informative uh, lecture. W what is the context of the uh, song of uh, songs? You know, like um, mm. um, most exegetes will say that it's an it's an allegory. So it's uh, it's presented as a dialogue between a lover and his beloved and her beloved, right? Um, some say that it's uh, describing Solomon, and Solomon is describing one of his wives, right? Uh, in that case, we would probably say allegory or typology. But usually, uh, and this book is quite controversial. It actually almost didn't make it into the Hebrew Bible canon in the first century, the Council of Yavne. Uh, but most rabbis would say that this is really describing, this is really an allegory for um, uh, God and Israel. It's describing their relationship. And at times, the, the relationship is quite intimate, but of course, this type of uh, parable, you know, this the marriage parable is controversial, but sort of gets the point across that Israel is very beloved to God. So that's the sort of immediate meaning of it. Yes, sir. So I want to go. Oh no. I mean, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was wondering if you could talk a little about a little about the verses in John. Yes. And the paraclete, the Ahmed, and if oh, yeah. I have to go away, or the one who will bring you into oh, all yes. truth will not come unto you. Yes, inshallah. Mashallah, he threw me a softball. <laughs> I think I can handle that one. So the verses were about the paraclete passage, passages in John. Um, uh, this, there's a few ways you can go about dealing with this. Um, John 14 and John 16. Um, if you read those texts, it seems at times that Jesus is talking about a human messenger to come, and then at other times he identifies the paraclete as the Holy Spirit, right? Um, and the Gospel of John, by the way, uh, is known for double entendres or sort of double meanings. So both of them could be true. Now what's interesting is that Jesus in the first John, the first epistle of John, is called parakletos, paraclete. Right, which is evidence that a human being can be called paraclete, and then, um, and then also in First John it says, uh, it says, believe not every spirit, uh, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for indeed many false prophets have gone out into the world. So it seems like in the Johannine community, 
the author of these texts. The word spirit and prophet could be used interchangeably. In other words, the paraclete seems to be a spirit of true prophecy. Maybe that's how we can do with these texts. Um, now, yeah, there's a condition, uh, I believe it's in John 16, that I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Um, um, but when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will show you all things. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I do not go, I think that's John 14, actually. If I do not go, the paraclete will not come unto you, right? So that's an interesting verse, that the coming of the paraclete, who or whatever it is, is conditional upon the departure of Christ. And clearly, if you read the New Testament, the Holy Spirit was active in the world before Christ made this statement, right? And of course, Catholics have a response to this, whether it's good or not, I don't know, but they have this idea of the Holy Spirit uh, that precedes eternally, but is sent in economy. The Holy Spirit comes and goes in economy in the temporal world, and this sort of explains uh, the apparent contradiction here in the text. Um, as far as any etymological similarities, there is an opinion that parakletos is a corruption of paraklutas. So the eta, it used to be a upsalon, and it became an eta. There's no manuscript evidence of this. There's a great uh, article written by, I want to say Sean Anthony, Ohio State, where he says that uh, probably the, f the first person to make that claim, it seems like it came from an Italian professor named Bonacci, I believe, from La, La Sapienza University in Italy, that, uh, that um, Pericletos with an eta is a, um, is a um, mutilation of Periclutos. Again, there's no external evidence of that. The other question is, this is Greek, so what did Isa salam, actually say in Syriac? Now, if you look at the Peshitta, which is the Syriac translation of the Greek, unfortunately, it says, uh, uh, it says parakleta. It just trans transliterated the Greek term. Um, Ibn Tayyib, who was a Christian scribe who translated Tatian's diatessaron uh, into Arabic, uh, so Syriac into Arabic, he rendered the Arabic as al-faraklit, right? We don't really know what he said. However, in the 12th century at St. Catherine's Monastery, some lectionaries, New Testament lectionaries were discovered. Um, and here we have an actual Syriac term for paraclete and it's munahamma, munahamma, munahamma. So this is from the root naham, naham. So according to the Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew English lexicon. Syriac does not have a Hamada root. There's no root in Syriac, like ham, Hamida Yahmadu. It doesn't have that. It has Naham, which might have subsumed that root. Uh, Wallahu alam. So there, there could be an etymological correspondence, right? Uh, Allahu alam. But interestingly, Parakletas means intercessor. That's what it means. Para means to be next to someone. In kletas, kaleo in Greek means to call somebody. So the paraclete is someone you call in distress, right? Seems like Jacob in the Shiloh, is, it seems like Isa alayhi salam is also prophesizing the Shiloh here, the, the, uh, the intercessor. And of course, the Prophet sallallahu name on the Yom al-Qiyamah is Ahmad. So Ismu Ahmad, Isa alayhi salam, is quoted to have said in the Quran, he doesn't say Ismu Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, Ismu Ahmad, and <clears throat> this could be a straight superlative, meaning his name is the most praised, rather than his name is Ahmad, it's a superlative, Wallahu alam, meaning the name of the Prophet Muhammad is mostly praised, or it's an indication that uh, on the Yawm al-Qiyamah, this is his actual name, Ahmad, Wallahu alam. I know that was sort of all over the place, but yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum um, I would imagine that a Christian scholar would characterize some, at least, of uh, your characterizations as reaches. Um, when I look at 
I, I, I skimmed a book by the Baha'i community claiming that Baha'u'llah is foreshadowed in the Quran, for example. Is there a clear criterion by which one could distinguish, you know, reaching in the text versus a straightforward foreshadowing, or is there any sort of comparative book that goes through and sort of makes the case that a particular prophecy is really prophetic and not a reach and, and vice versa? Is there a particular book what? I didn't catch the last part. I'm wondering if there's a, a book or a resource that could go through and say, for example, like some, some of the things that you mentioned sound extremely convincing. Um, and I think to, dis to dismiss it as a reach is simplistic, yeah. but I would also say that some of the things, for example, the other... It's a reach. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. The other faith communities have, have taken, you know, ones after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam yeah. are reaches in my mind, but I'm, you know, biased yeah. as a Muslim. So I'm wondering if there's something that yeah. kind of goes through well, it. Well, I, I would say that it's important. I mean, we're looking at isolated verses, right? Yeah. I think it's very, very important to look at the... Uh, look at the totality of the text and of what we can ascertain to be the original teaching of that would be wh who that prophet might be. Uh, so, with the case of Baha'u'llah, I mean, there are multiple hadith um, where um, the Prophet وسلم, is characterized as being the final prophet. Right. Right. So, what do you do with all of that? Right. Uh, well, you can say, well, the ulama, you know, they corrupted things and so on and so forth. Yeah, but there are texts that are difficult to deal with. So what I can do, I'm prepared to deal with the entire biblical text. I don't think there's necessarily anything uh, in the biblical text that cannot be reconciled in one way or another um, with the Islamic tradition. Now, we actually have um, a way of dealing with apparent contradictions between the Bible and the Quran, and this is intimated in the Quran itself, if you take that approach, that there's tahrif in the nas, that there's, um, that there's corruption in the text, right? And according, if you read someone like Ehrman, right, for example, it's very clear that there is definitely corruption in the text, although his method uh, can be called into question uh, at times. Uh, so, I mean, it's interesting that Christians might characterize this as reaching, and they do, you're right. Uh, it's very interesting to me because um, for a Christian to go into the Hebrew text and to draw out the deity of Christ from a Hebrew text, wow, that's difficult. Lo ish el, ki anuchi el, velo ish. Many times in the Hebrew Bible, indeed I am God and not a man. Indeed I am God and not a man. God is not a man, right? but they've managed to do it. Now, if you ask a Christian, well, why do you believe that then? The Christian response is, well, this is what is stated in scripture. Like Matthew, right? He's quoting these things from the Old Testament and Matthew is inspired by the Holy Ghost. Uh, so that is the word of God. So what I'm showing here, this, none of this is binding upon us to believe in any of this, right? This is just an illustration I'm making. So there's a difference between something revealed in a scripture um, and something that a scholar is simply sort of proposing, right? So I think the, the short answer to your question is I think we need to look at the totality of the tradition and deal with other problematic uh, aspects that people tend to ignore. We don't want to engage in what's known as salad bar hermeneutics, so walk by and pick up what we want, right? Um, so, yeah, I hope I answered that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, taking vicarious atonement, deity of Christ, Trinity from the Hebrew text, that's, that's quite a difficult task, I think. Much more difficult than what I'm doing because Islamic theology and Jewish theology, I mean, you can read the 13 principles of Maimonides and pretty much go, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Uh, obviously, he believes that there's no prophecy. There's no prophet greater than Moses. But as far as his theological understandings of God and um, as far as the, the oneness of God, we're certainly in agreement with that. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Wow. I apologize, uh, I was a little late, so uh, if these questions have already been answered in the first part, I'll go back to the video. Um, so the, the ayah that mentions maktuban endahum fit tawrati wal injil. I've heard many people use this as a, not this particular ayah, other ayat, uh, that are what is the endahum? Are we saying that all of the text, the canonized text, what are we looking at? So that's one part of the question. Um, you know, do we consider the apocryphal text as part of that material? I know they don't, obviously. And then the second part of that would be, here it mentions specifically the Torah. 
and that's supposed to be the first five books. And so we did jump into some mm. of the non-first five books. And I'm curious if that's just natural as part of the uh, evaluation of it. And the third part possibly to the question is, how early does this go? I mean, how far back can we go to find documentation of Muslims, you know, talking about here are the text from, you know, their scriptures, maybe people who converted from Christianity or Judaism. Um, is this something in our modern, you know, few hundred years that this research has been done? Or can we go back a thousand years and find people talking mm. about it? Apparently you did miss the first part. No. <laughs> no. So, maktuban indahum fi Torah. So we said that indahum seems to mean what they have with them at that time. What the Jews and Christians have when this ayah was revealed, maktuban, that there are descriptions. Now, again, what are these descriptions? Are they sort of general qualities and the prophets fits the descriptions? Or are they specific references? That's a difference of opinion. But indahum seems to mean that. And the translation that the sister read was a good translation whom they find mentioned in their Torah and Gospel, the one that they have, the one that they're calling Torah and Gospel, there seems to be um, some um, things that are preserved that seem to point to the Prophet um, As far as Torah goes, the word Torah, the word Torah is a very, very um, uh, imprecise word, right? So yes, the first five books are called the Torah, they're also called Chumash, um, the entire Old Testament is called Hatorah Shebi uh, uh, Ketav, uh, the written Torah. So rabbis use the word Torah for the entire Old Testament in addition to the word Tanakh. In fact, the entire Old Testament, the Tanakh, as well as the Gemara and the, uh, sorry, Mishnah and Tamara, which is the Talmud, you put these two together, the written, the Old Testament and the Talmud, and that's called Ha Torah Min Hash Min Shaimayim, the Torah which is from heaven. So the word Torah ha can mean the entire corpus, the entire corpus of Jewish sacred texts, because rabbis, at least Orthodox Judaism, believes that the Mishnah and the Gemara are inspired by the Ruach Kadosh, that rabbis are being inspired to write those things. That's sacred text. So the word Torah, as they understood it, endahum, could mean a, a lot of things, not just necessarily the first five books. And then the last, the question, um, I mentioned earlier that at the top of my lecture that initially, initially, um, Muslim uh, exegetes would sort of do a cursory reading of the Torah and the gospel, right? Uh, with limited knowledge of, you know, Greek and Hebrew and Syriac and biblical history and things like that. And on the surface, they concluded that there's nothing about the Prophet ﷺ. So then you have this idea of tahrif al-nas. And there's some Quranic ayat that can be interpreted to mean that indeed there's corruption of the text of what the Jews and the Christians call the Torah and, in the, and the Injil. But upon further inspection, Later, after Imam al-Tabari, you have exegetes going into these books and saying, wait a minute, there's, there's something more to this, right? And so, عندهم في Torah والإنجيل, that is with them, there have been no major redactions to the Tanakh since this ayah was revealed. So, عندهم still is in effect, as it were. So, there's something in the Bible today that seems to indicate the Prophet wasallam. Is it these? I don't know. Allahu alam. This is my sort of... Um, guesswork, if you will. Thank you. But probably yes. <laughs> Allahu <laughs> Allah. we'll, we'll take one more question from the microphone and then one question from online to conclude. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Um, I was a Christian and um, going through some of the passage, you actually asked a question. I don't know how Christians answer this part, which is John, um, how it is supposed, it's supposed to be the Holy Spirit coming to, um, coming to, like coming after Christ le leaves, right? Um, so in a discussion with my parents, <laughs> um, I came and I told them how in nowhere in the New Testament, Jesus, says I am God. And then I put them on the spot when I said, if Jesus was God, who was he praying to in the Mount of the Olives? Oh. 
And then they came up when they said, um, they came and they said, um, when he was talking, but I don't know how that translation, and I mean, and it, this goes back to the, when Constantine called all the 12 tribes and they decided what books to stay in and, and, and put the Bible together. And also the, a, lot of, a lot of it is lost in translation. Um, when Jesus is, um, when he's talking and he says that, my father, and so that's kind of like him saying that's where you know um, that's where they came back with that statement that Jesus himself said that he was um, the son of the Father, mm -hmm. therefore he's God, mm -hmm. and or or that there's. Uh, or that the three, he also mentioned the three. I don't, I don't know what passage it is on the Bible, mm -hmm. um, but I, I remember reading it. So how, how did that come? Like, mm -hmm. where, um, I'm trying to clarify my question. So with the translations, you know, we need to go back to Aramaic. Yeah. How did the, how did the, um, did the father, part came to be? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's a good question. So it's interesting, um, these terms, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, these are all Hebraisms. These terms are used in Judaism, and we must not disconnect them from their roots. Now, these terms were, what's the right word, appropriated, co-opted by early Christian scholars and redefined or re-theologized uh, in the form of a triune deity, right? But the terms themselves are found in the Old Testament. In Isaiah, for example, one of the prayers of Isaiah is, Atta Adonai Avinu, you are the Lord our Father. And, you know, Jews don't believe that uh, anyone on earth is a literal or pre-eternal son of God, right? That's a Christian belief. The term is there. So you can say that even in the New Testament, right, there is no explicit verse, in my opinion, that says that these three are one. I mean, there was something in 1 John 5, 7 that was removed. It's not found in the most ancient Greek manuscripts. So you've, you have the terms again, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but those are terms also found in the Old Testament. So the ingredients, if you will, of the Trinity is in the Old and New Testaments, but I don't think the doctrine is there. You have to, you have to, um, you have to engage with the patristics, the early church fathers, as to how they are interpreting these terms and these verses in the New Testament, right? So these are Hebra Hebraisms. I mean, Jesus prays, uh, he teaches his disciples how to pray in Matthew, avunda vashmayo in Aramaic, uh, our Father who art in heaven, our Father, all of us, right? Who is, who is this, uh, this Father? So uh, Rumi says, he says, you know, don't you know that that father means Rab, and Ibn means Abd, right? That father in the biblical text, it really means Rab, Lord, right? The one who is, the one who is close to you, the one who takes care of you, right? Kama Rabbayani Sagira. This is a dua we make for our, for our parents. Irham Huma, Kama Rabbayani Sagira. Have mercy on them as they raised me up in stages. That's your Rab, right? So this is a, this is majaz, this is figurative language that is thoroughly literalized by early proto-Orthodox Christian church fathers. And now the father is the literal father. He has a literal son and literal does not mean begotten of the flesh. It means that he's pre-eternal, they share an essence, right? So, but I agree with you, the, the fact that Christ in the New Testament worships the father I mean, the Father is greater than the Son in his hypostasis or person. That's what Jesus says, the Father is greater than I, but they are essentially equal. So if they're essentially equal, does that merit worship of the Father by the Son? If they're essentially the same person, I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> but even if you read Paul, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And he uses the word huyoi, which is what's used for Jesus. 
huioi tu theu, the, the son of God. So according to Paul, this is figurative language. Now what makes Jesus monogenes huyas? What makes him the one of a kind son, which is oftentimes translated as only begotten son, but monogenes means unique one of a kind son. Why is Jesus the unique son? Is because he is al Messiah. He is the Messiah. And there's only one Messiah. That's that's what Arius said. I think we need to Arius got a bad rap. You know, my students in my comparative theology class, every fifteen minutes I go, Miskeen Arius, Bichara. I think he was right about of course Arius is totally reviled for the last sixteen centuries by by the proto-Orthodox and the Orthodox. But the way that he interprets the text is very interesting. I mean, the Father and I are one. This is John 10, 30. And, and Christian Trinitarian exegetes, they say, see right here, this is, you know, this is oneness, essential ontological oneness. But Arius says, look at the context. You know, I'm pulling verses out of, you know, there's no apparent context. That's why I'm saying we have to look at context. And in the context of John chapter 10, it's very clear that this oneness is a unity of purpose and intention, not in ontology. I think that is quite a stretch. Ms. Keen Arias. Thank you. If I could close with a question from online, then oh, yes. we can close it out. Thank you. So Chaplain Rafael Lentingua asks, in the Quran, chapter 2, verse 79, it literally states, well, what may be translated as, that they, quote, write the scriptures or book with their hands. Then they say, quote, this is from God, to barter with it a little price. So woe to them for what their hands have written, and woe to them for what they earn. Is this not to be understood literally? How can it be limited to only, quote, mis misinterpretation or misunderstanding? And then the last question was, <clears throat> can the same standard of applying hermeneutics to prove Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the Bible also be used to support claims of Jesus's, peace be upon him, divinity according to Christianity? Thank you. Excellent questions. I'll start with the second question. The second question has been done. Giulio Bassetti Sani, a Franciscan Catholic, uh, wrote a book called, what do you call it? Uh, the, Cor the, Cor the Quran with a K. The Quran in the Light of Christ, where he claims that the entire Quran, first he thought it was a, a satanic inspiration, and then he changed his mind, it's a little bit better now, that it's an actual revelation of God, but it's a Christian text, and that, the, uh, that only a Christian can actually understand the Quran, that everything in the Quran is pointing to the deity of Christ. So my response to that is, yeah, you can do it, good luck. You know, Wala taqulu thalatha. What do you do with that? Don't say three. Intahu khayru lakum, innam Allahu ilahun wahid. Laqad kafara ladhina qalu, inna Allaha huwa al-Masih ibn Maryam. So good luck with that. So, so what I'm doing with the Bible is a little bit different. Historians will tell us that very evidently there was always a Unitarian strain within Christianity. Unitarian. And Ehrman would say the original Christians were Ebionites. I and mean, these are just basically Jews who believed in Jesus as the Messiah. The, the Arians believed in the Gospel of John. They didn't believe in uh, the ontological sameness, hamausian, between the Father and the Son, and they revered the Gospel of John. My point is, there's always been a Unitarian understanding of the biblical text, New Testament, but no one in the history of Quranic exegetical history has ever said, you know what, I think the Prophet وسلم, is a divine incarnation, or I think the Quran, uh, or, or to claim that the, the Sahaba actually worshipped Jesus. That's the original creed of the Sahaba. Good luck. I don't know if it's going to work out for you. It didn't work out for Julio Bassetti's son. Um, but, so I say that that, was, that would be the difference. The other question about, فَوَيْلُوا لِلَّذِينَ يَكْتَبُونَ الْكِتَابِ Woe to those who write the book with their right hand. Yeah, this is a verse that is used to, as a proof text or dalil that there has been tahrif of the nas, that there has been corruption of the text of the Bible. But you can also examine that verse in light of attempted scriptural alterations made 
by scribes for theological reasons. That certainly there were attempts made by Christian scribes to change the text of the New Testament. And as time went on, these uh, fabrications to the text were eventually weeded out. I mean, one could make that, that claim as well. I mean, there was a, I'm not gonna mention his name, but there was some Egyptian scientist who thought he was a prophet and he started printing Qur'ans. He removed two verses from Toba. Well, what did he do? Did he corrupt the Qur'an then? No, because there's a strong oral tradition and the, the Qur'an, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is providentially guarding the Qur'an with his hufad and with his scholar, the scholarship of the ulama, right? Uh, so I think there's a way of interpreting that ayah to mean something like there have been scribes who have tried to alter the text of the Bible for their own personal gain, but they were unsuccessful, right? And this has been going on. I mean, just read Ehrman's book, Misquoting Jesus. I think there's a section in there where he talks about proto-Orthodox alterations to the text, Gnostic alterations to the text, Marcionite alterations to the text, Docetist alterations to the text. And these things over time with new discoveries and scholarship have been weeded out of the text. Attempts were made. I think um, I'm tired, so. Jazakallah khair. Thank you.